Hi, welcome back to the 52-Week Bible Challenge. I'm Kelly. And I'm Donovan. This is Yuki. <laughs> We're on week 38. 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. Yeah, we're, we're getting the love from our little pup here. Yes. <laughs> we right. obviously have our red shirts on to be fun, even though we kind of clash, but you get the picture. <laughs> and I will have to say, getting ready for this, Donovan has been <sighs> singing like all the different love songs that he can think of that have the word love in them that talk about love. He's not doing them for you here, but I got to enjoy I'll save it. You. So I'll no, spare you. it was fun. It was fun, <laughs> which it, it's a good point. That, I mean, there's a lot of songs that talk about love. Why? Because we yes. like love. We love love. <laughs> everyone loves love. Yeah. Everyone wants to be loved. They want love. But I think part of the problem is that people don't really know what love means. So this is what we're going to learn today. Yeah. We're going to be in First Corinthians 13, which is the love chapter. And it explains what love is. Uh, yeah, we were just talking and Kelly's like, did you look up what love means? I'm like, the whole chapter is what loves me. That's, that's what we're doing. So, but I he guess did, we'll... And he did for me now. It's agape. Yes, it is. Yeah. It's agape. So here we go. First <laughs> Corinthians 13. And we're just going to go verse by verse. There's only 13 verses. So we'll just go through each one. Can I say something before we start? I, I wrote a little title for myself uh, for this chapter besides just the love chapter. I wrote... No one cares how much you know until I know how much you care. Because this chapter 13 mm. is in between 12 and 14, which Paul is talking about gifts, gifts in the church, how they're to be used and whatnot. So in between all that is love. So Yeah, I think that's a good context because I would definitely t say take a Bible challenge this week and read 12 through 14 all the way through in one reading because this is actually... A, parent, um, a parenthetical in the middle of a thought. And that thought is just that, you know, gifts are important and we should be seeking the gifts of the Holy Spirit and, and looking to exercise them in an orderly way. However, the gifts don't matter if you don't have love. And that brings us to verse one, yeah. which Paul says, if I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. The tongues of men and angels, that's, that's really referring to the speaking of speaking in tongues, the gift of tongues. Um, but it could also even refer to just elegant preaching and, and speaking. Mm. If, if you preach eloquently, if you are the best orator that is out there, but you don't have love, you just sound like a noisy gong. And I could just think about your kids when they get those pots and pans and they're little <laughs> and they're, they're making a pot and pan drum kit in the garage and in, in the kitchen and in the kitchen. yeah in the kitchen you want to cover your ears yes. if there is a noisy gong or a clanging <laughs> cymbal yeah too much for me <laughs> yep and then he goes on in verse two and he says and if i have prophetic powers and i understand all mysteries and all knowledge and i have all faith so as to remove mountains but i have not love i am nothing the first one is kind of like okay this is person's noisy but basically saying like if i know it all if i have the sum of all human knowledge and i can prophesy and i can i can move mountains and perform miracles and do do things because i am super smart but i don't have love then it doesn't matter and I am nothing. I, mean, I am nothing is a powerful, is a powerful way of saying that. It is. Yeah. And I, I thought about this week, how can we apply this? I think I could definitely do more in love versus just doing things because they're on my to-do list or checklist. So I've definitely been challenged to let love be my motivation, not, not getting things on my checklist done. I definitely have areas mm -hmm. to grow in this. In my notes, I kind of wrote just for myself, like head knowledge and wisdom and understanding alone don't make me important or significant. Like that's not mm. that's not what makes us important. Like that's what the world would say. And I know we've talked in previous, you know, previous sessions about the world's knowledge versus God or, you know, the world's wisdom is foolishness and versus God's wisdom. And this is this is an example of that. Mm. Right. The world would say to have love, to love others is not important compared to having knowledge or being smart or being powerful like that's the world's going to tell you that those things are important um, and make you make you important and make you significant but 
But I think uh, it, certainly those of us who are believers, we understand this because, I mean, I think we'd also look at someone like Mother Teresa who gave up everything to go serve in the slums of India. We look at people like that and we admire we admire that. Um, yeah. But I think in our daily lives, in our daily struggles, it's easy to get that all mixed up. And and Paul is really talking about what it means to to love and or what it means to love and who, what that makes us or really what that doesn't make us if we don't love because he's kind of talking about the the negative effects of like doing all these things but not having love and then he, and then a third time he's or in the verse three he says if i give away all i have and if i deliver up my body to be burned but have not love i gain nothing and i think this is really speaking to rewards so we've talked we mm-hmm. talked about rewards right last week and we talked about sac you know sac well sacrifice and how like we need to be building with the the good building materials not with the wood hay and stubble and and what he's basically saying is like if i if i tithe everything i own if i give everything i own away but i don't have love so like if mother Teresa sold everything she had and went and just did all this stuff but didn't actually love the people she was ministering to then that that she gained nothing Mm. you know and i'm not saying she did that i'm just saying like that's an example and and of somebody who's who gave up everything and to go to go serve uh, as she saw, as she felt called. So it, it's same same with us. Like if we're giving to to check a box or to be legalistic or to look good or to even gain points with God, like maybe we're following all the rules and keep giving in secret and not telling other people. But in our heart, we're not doing it because we love Christ and we love his people, then then that giving uh, really does nothing for it. It, it, it. We gain nothing in that. And I think that just speaks to the power and importance of love um, because we do go back to the greatest commandment, right? And the greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. Love God and love people, mm. right? Those are... That is the greatest commandment. So, so this is telling us how this chapter it's, we're going to go on here. It's telling us, how do you do that? How do you do that? So first we need to love God with everything we are. And I think, I think that's an important part too, right? Like if we're doing what we're doing because we love God and we know that that's what God is wanting us to do and we're doing it because we love him, then we're doing it with the right motive. It makes me think of that verse that we can love because he first loved us. So You know, Mother Teresa, in your example, she was able to do that because she received all that love from the Lord. So if we're going to go out and love others, we have to first be receiving from the Lord. And I would say I would say daily Mm -hmm. hearing from the Lord, relying on him and being filled with him before we go out and minister to others. But what is love? What's the definition of love? (laughs) So now Paul is going to explain it to us. And there's actually... um, it's a list of pros and cons or positives and negatives. I kind of rewrote it in my notes mm-hmm. as pluses and minuses of things that love is and things that love is not. Huh. And I think that's important to kind of look at this because as you look at what it is, you can infer that it's not the opposite. And so and, you, and if you look at it as what it's not, you can infer that, well, it must be the opposite of that. Mm. So, so we get to verse four and it says, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant. And we'll just stop there. Uh, so what is it? So it's patient and patience is long suffering. The, the idea w- of waiting for others, not demanding everything now. Um, it's kind, right? It, it's nice. <laughs> um, so what isn't it? It's not envious. It doesn't, um, it doesn't boast. It's not bragging about itself. You're not, so a person who's loving isn't going to be like, oh man, I wish I could have had that thing that this person got or be upset Ooh. that someone else got the promotion or be like, look what I have, you know, in front of someone else, you know, they're not going to, a person who's loving isn't going to be arrogant. Mm. They're not going to be proud. Um, and, and I think we've all probably met people or seen, seen people or, you know, that are arrogant and rude and, and, and those people um, aren't, they're bristly, right? And they're, yeah. they're not expressing love. They don't and, want to be around them. And really like en- <laughs> being envious and boastful and arrogant and to go on in chapter five, he says rude, or, you know, mm. or rude. Those are very selfish 
things because they're putting, you know, if you're envious, you're thinking I should have what someone else has. If you're boasting, you're saying I'm better than you because of whatever. If you're arrogant or you're rude, you're placing yourself, you're making yourself more important than the other person. So whereas if you're patient, you're putting your needs in submission to someone else because you're, you're, you're waiting, you're waiting for them as opposed to demanding them to meet your timeline. Oh, this is really, it's really hitting home for me right now, just even, even though I've been reading this all week, but it's like, man, I, th- I think I had a, a jealous moment this morning and I had to work through the Lord with that and like, what's really going on here? And, mm-hmm. and I took care of that. But again, like I said, I just have so much room to grow. Yes. But I have to say, <laughs> it's really nice though, when you do mess up and it's with someone who is patient and kind, it's like, you still are super bummed that you messed up and you you tell them but you just know that they're going to be patient and kind about it Mm -hmm. it's so refreshing and it just it makes just makes it easier to be around people when they're patient and kind (laughs) well yeah and i mean i you know i think you know you say you have a lot of room to grow i have a lot of room to grow in this as well this is kind of like reading this it's like oh i'm thinking about things that i'm envious about or maybe i'm impatient about and it does it 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 hits you it hits you personally. And that's where the, it's intended to. I mean, Paul's yeah. writing this as a correction, as a rebuke to the Corinthian church, because they were getting all arrogant and envious about other people's spiritual gifts. Ah. Right. So they weren't even envious about things like, oh, they got a new Porsche or they get to go on a nice vacation or they they have kids that are all whatever. So they weren't envious about those things. Mm. They were envious about, well, that person prophesies and that person has, can speak in tongues and that person, you know, can do whatever. And, and they were getting arrogant and proud and rude about it Mm. instead of exercising the gifts in love, which is what God intends. This applies to all areas of life. And that's why this is probably one of the most famous passages of scripture. So we can go on, verse five. Um, so he say, so in verse four, he said, it is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. And then in verse six, he says, it does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. This is probably, it's not irritable. It hits me at home. I get irritable and um, I get resentful uh, when things don't go my way. Uh, uh, I think it's easier to not do that in a church setting or even at home, but maybe at work or in just out in public or, or whatever, getting irritable in traffic, getting irritable at the grocery store, getting irritable <laughs> at lines. the person. Yeah. And then resentful kind of goes with envious or whatever, like resentful, like, why didn't I get that promotion? Or why didn't I get this thing? Or why do I have to do whatever? That's resentful. And, and those, these are, I mean, I don't know. Paul's not, Paul's not pulling his punches. I mean, he's just unloading with both barrels saying, Hey, this is, this is what it is. But I think it's so good because it really frames what love is. So this is, these are things that love is not right. So what does that mean? I think in order to know what love is, so what is love? Well, what's the obvious opposite of envy? The the opposite of envy is rejoicing when someone else gets something that, that you would like to have. What's the opposite of boasting? Well, being humble and not false humility, true humility. What's the opposite of being irritable? Well, really kind of being patient and, and mm, you know, and, yeah. and being unflappable, I guess, you know. Ooh, unflappable. Yeah, yeah unflappable. <laughs> uh, and and so so love love is unflappable. <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't resent. It it's it's and it rejoices in what other people stuff say. And that's what he goes on to say. I don't rejoice at wrongdoing. I don't rejoice when I see people do bad things or bad things happen i rejoice with the truth i rejoice with jesus i rejoice when tr- when truth wins i rejoice when good things happen to other people because i because i love nasb says verse 7 uh, love bears all things believes all things hopes all things endures all things and then i thought well that it's one of those lo- love is love is bearing mm-hmm. all things that's not a fun, fluffy, love, Valentine card mm-hmm. type feeling. Like that's bearing, I think like bearing one another's burdens. Yeah. Always forgiving the 70 times, seven times, bearing all things. It's not yeah. easy. 
It's not a fluffy, happy feeling. <laughs> yeah, that verse seven really stuck out to me. Mm. Um, and uh, because I was really reminded of verse, first John four, seven and eight says, beloved, let us love one another for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. And anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. And why that's important to me or why that's powerful is that I, when I read verse seven, I, instead of saying love there, I put God in that spot and I, and I put me in all things. So God bears me. He bears me and my burdens. Mm. God believes in me. God hopes for me Mm. to have good things. God endures all of my cred <laughs> that I put up with, right? Yeah. You know, and so that, because God is doing that, I need to be doing that as well for one. So I need to be mm-hmm. bearing all things in love. I need to believe all things. Now, when I read that, you know, I stopped and believe all things. Well, that doesn't mean I believe all religions. I doesn't mean I believe, you know, your truth versus my truth. That's not, that's not what this is yeah. means because we rejoice with truth. So truth is a real thing, but believe believes all things, believes in people, believes in true things, believes in good things. Like, you know, it's not, love is not Mr. Grumpy Pants. That's (laughs) like, well, we'll see if that happens. No, love believes that the good things are going to happen, believes that, believes in the person. I just think you you hear stories about athletes or people that are like, this person believed in me and I could do Mm. it. That's love, right? And when someone believes in you, that's showing love. And God believes in you. God believes in us. Why? How do we know that God believes in us? How do you know that God believes in you, Donovan? Why? Because God sent his one and only son to die and suffer for our sins so that we could know him and have relationship with him. Like if he didn't love us, if he didn't want us to, if he didn't believe in us, if he didn't believe that it would work, then he wouldn't have done it. So he did believe in us. And that's that's powerful. It is powerful. And another thing I thought of is, what love isn't, you kind of talked about it a little bit with like, oh, that's your truth. It's common nowadays in popular culture to say you have to approve of whatever anybody is doing because that's love. So they're redefining love as approval of any sort of behavior that that person chooses. But if we remember at the end of Romans 1, basically summarizing it says we can't approve of perverse behavior. So it's not love to approve of someone else's perverse behavior. We'll be accused of not being loving when we don't approve perverse behavior, but the world isn't our judge. God's our judge. So you have to, it's, it's hard. You have to hold fast to the truth, which is found in his word, but that Mm -hmm. just, it's a, it's a challenging thing. It is. And I I think as you're talking, what, what we're seeing here is that love is not dependent upon the recipient. Mm. It's dependent upon the lover. Love is not love if the person that I'm loving feels that I'm patient or feels that I'm kind Mm. or feels that I'm not envious or boastful. It's only loving if I am patient Mm. and I am kind. And so in that regard where someone's saying, hey, you can only love me if you accept me, it's like, that's really not, that's really not true. You can love somebody not accept their behavior, not accept their worldview, not accept their beliefs, but still truly love them. And in fact, if you do love them, it will drive you to speak the truth. And that's what I think the world and and people that aren't Christians maybe have a hard time grasping or understanding because somebody who believes that, well, if you love me, you'll accept me, is basically saying that I shouldn't have to change my beliefs or my ways or that I'm right and and essentially you're wrong and because I'm right if you really love me you would believe what I believe but the reality is is that you know we can if we truly love the lost right if we we would tell them the truth because by loving them by not telling them the truth in essence you're withholding vital information. Now that doesn't mean you beat it over the head. I mean, if you tell somebody the gospel and they reject it, then you've done, you've told them and then you could pray for them. And, and if the Holy Spirit leads you again, you do it again. But, but the point is to have the, the cure, to have the solution to people's problems mm. and never tell them what it is, 
is not loving. We don't rejoice at long doing, lo- wrongdoing, right? So that's part of this, what yeah. you're saying, right? Yeah. Love is not being like, oh, great, you went and robbed a bank. I love you so much. I'm so proud of you. That's not, no, yeah. no, that is not love. That That is, that is, you would say, oh, wow, that is very wrong. You should turn yourself in and there's going to be consequences. But if you repent and confess and turn away from your, your sin, then you'll, you'll have eternal life, right? I think that's, that's showing love. And it kind of what you're talking about is love is action, not it is. just feeling. It, absolutely. Mm-hmm. I think we see that here. Love is yeah. love is not how we feel on the inside. Love is an action. It's a verb. Yeah, right. It's uh, it, love. Love. Love is a verb. It's something you do. It's something that comes out of you in behavior. And obviously it starts with some sort of attachment or some sort of for lack of a better term, you know, it might start with the feeling or the fe- the emotions might help indicate that there is love there, but it goes beyond the emotional. You can be very loving and unemotional at the same time because you could be patient and kind and, Ooh. you know, you could you could bear all things and believe all things and hope all things and endure all things and not feel butterflies in your stomach. Interesting. I don't think that's something we think about very often. So I'm glad you brought that up. (laughs) Yeah. And then he goes on in in verse eight. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, then the partial will pass away. And so that's verses eight through ten. The important part here is that love, love doesn't end. So again, keeping in context, this just chapter is in the middle of this chapter that's talking about prophecies and tongues and trying to to explain to people what their importance is in this big scheme of things. If you read 12 and you read 14, prophecy is important. You should want to prophesy. You should ask God to prophesy. The prophecy is real. It shouldn't be despised. We should be seeking prophecies. now. There's, and there's order in the way that that is done, right? It's not just anybody can prophesy. There's order. Uh, they need to be tested, all that. But that prophecy, that gift, that spiritual gift is for a time and for a season. And uh, same with speaking in tongues. Like th- there's purpose, like, again, that's all in, tw- in 12 and 14. Th- that's a gift. That gift is, is active today. Um, but someday in the future, when the perfect comes, so, so there's all sorts of scholarly debates on what that means, but I think the general consensus is that the perfect comes means when we are in heaven with Jesus, like when we, when we are perfect, when, when the world has been restored Mm -hmm. into perfection and the old is passed away and the new heaven and the new earth somewhere in that timeline, like, I, I don't know exactly what the perfect means in that context, but Sometime in the future, when the perfect has come, there won't be a need for prophecy anymore. And I think he goes on to say that uh, we won't need tongues. We won't need words of knowledge downloaded from God because we will be in a place of perfection and we will know everything that we need to know. But in that world, in that state, love will still exist because love never ends. Mm. It's eternal right? Prophecy is not eternal. Tongues is not eternal, but love is eternal. Yeah, I think we saw that in Zechariah, where those who were still prophesying once the Lord had come back, they were, their their parents would like thrust them through with a sword or something because there's no need to prophesy because Jesus is there. Mm. So yeah, we even saw, saw that in the Old Testament. And I have to say, I like that your version uh, ESV said love never ends. Mine in the NASB says love never fails. But that word end calls back to what he says in the rest of the verse of tongues ending, prophecy ending, but love never ends because these are all ending type words. So mm-hmm. that that really um, helped me understand more. Thank you. Yep. And so then just to kind of repeat verse nine, for we know it, for we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. Basically what he's saying is like when we prophesy, when we get like a word of knowledge or, or when we're speaking in tongues, like that is, that's not a, a complete and total, total knowledge. Like we don't get, mm. prophecy doesn't give us everything that we need to know. We'll probably talk more about this next week as we get into some other future events, but essentially 
prophecy tells us things are going to happen, but maybe not when, or maybe not how, or exactly what it's going to look like. There were hundreds, hundreds of prophecies about Jesus, many of which did people didn't even realize were prophecies about Jesus until after Jesus came and fulfilled them. Mm. And so just the reality is, is that um, we don't, we don't know until the actual fulfillment happens. And then he goes on in verse 11. He says, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So basically Paul's just saying, hey, I, we are in a childish state right, right, right now. Right now we only see dimly. Right now we only know in part because we are still in our childish state compared to what it'll be like when we are fully grown and in, in our glorified heavenly state. Which so, we'll get to talk about in the next lesson, yes. 1 Corinthians 15, about our resurrected bodies, the glorified bodies, what those will be like. And I'm really excited for that. And um, this verse about the mirror, though, we see in a mirror dimly in verse 12. I think uh, I think in a previous time when I was studying this, I looked up about mirrors. I was like, oh, they had mirrors back then. You know, when, when did that come about? Well, of course, it wasn't like the nice, very clear mirrors that we have nowadays. So the mirrors that they had were dim. They were made of different materials that were maybe only a little bit reflective. And it made me think of even nowadays, you sometimes you go to um, an event at a large place, like maybe a, a stadium at a school or something. And in the bathrooms, they have those mirrors that are kind of like warbly and they're not very clear. I think they make them that way on purpose because they don't want people lingering in the bathrooms. And at some places they even take away the mirrors because they're like, we don't want you lingering in the bathrooms. But you, I think, I think, I think at this point, all of us have still seen one of those, like not very bright, oh, yeah. a dim mirror. So you, you get that picture of what it's like. It's like, oh yeah, I can kind of see what I look like, but not really enough to yeah. help me out to see if there's some broccoli in my teeth type of thing. Well, a lot, yeah, a lot of them were like polished metal and then you got to think they didn't have electric lighting. So they would just be having candlelight or maybe sunlight, mm. you know, um, yeah. if it was daytime. But I, I like he said, now we see in a mirror dimly, like, well, what are you looking at in a mirror? You're looking at yourself in a mirror, but then we're going to see face to face. And mm. I just, as I'm thinking about this right now, like, well, who are we going to see face to face? Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is we be, it becomes our mirror like that's who we want wow. to become that like we want to become mm. like christ we want to look like christ so that's i don't know i just so thinking about that like right now we see that very dimly very very dimly rough with scratches like i am not a reflection of christ i'm a very poor reflection of christ right now mm. but you know when we're glorified and and when sin is no more and we've been cleaned up and get you know in our heavenly robes and all that like we will be reflections of christ Nice. Yeah, there's stuff to look forward to. I think you maybe said it in the last or previous episode that you weren't looking forward to heaven because uh, years, many years ago when mm -hmm. you were first saved, because you thought it was an endless worship service. But like there's there's so much more to look forward to, mm -hmm. especially as we get older, you start experiencing those aches and pains in your body. And it's like, mm -hmm. oh, it'll be so great when this yes. flesh has been redeemed and glorified. So there's yep. stuff to look forward to. Yep. We'll wrap it up with verse 13. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. And I think that's just an important reminder that we need to have faith and we need to have hope and we need to have love. But the greatest, the greatest, the most important of these is love. And as I've just in general, as thinking about this passage in its, in its totality and what does this mean? Like I would just really think about like, what does it look like to love other people? And like, do I love the people I encounter, right? Do I love the people I see when I'm on my way to work or at work? Do I love the people I encounter in my community? And like I said, it's not an emotional like, oh, I love you so much, man. Give me a hug, right? Like, no, that's not <laughs> that's not what it, it feels like. But it, but what it, it becomes a tugging. So what I what I see is that when I see, you know, poverty or I see someone homeless, I'm on the bus and like someone's you know homeless on the side of the street. It's like, well, yeah, I'm not right there in their face. And even if I did, they probably wouldn't be very nice to me. But at the same time, like my heart goes out to them. Like I I want. I know that they are 
better than they see themselves. I know that God sees them in a better light than they see themselves and that he wants them to be saved and he wants them to know the gospel. It moves me in a way, I guess, and that that's a reflection of love. And that's hoping all things, hoping that Mm. they could learn, hoping that they could know the gospel and, and trying to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit and obedient. If God's calling me to say something to somebody or give, give something to somebody or, or, um, and I, I mean, I'm not saying I'm, I'm definitely not perfect at that, but but I, 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 I see that from time to time, like, okay, if we all love, I mean, and then I imagine what would the world be like if everybody lived their life this way all the time for everybody? Heaven, I'm in heaven. Yeah, yeah, it would be, it would be heaven. You know, I mean, it's like, there's no envy. Everyone's patient. Everyone's kind. There's no arrogance. No one's insisting on their own way. Yeah. And my version, verse five, I don't, I don't think we touched on it much. It says, does not keep a list of wrongs. Mm. That's really good. And that's a question to ask yourself, like, Lord, is there anywhere or against anyone? Am I keeping a list of wrongs? And just be mm. quiet and wait for the Lord to speak to you. Mm-hmm. And that that's some of the application type prayers that I prayed this week, asking the Lord to show me where I'm not being loving. And, and he's so gentle. And, mm-hmm. and kind and patient yep. and merciful, graceful. I could go on in that, in that he's not just showing me all my wrongs at once, but w- what I can handle. And we move on from there. And verse 13 that you just read, the very last verse of the chapter, I just remembered that I wrote that verse in my senior high school yearbook. I think as seniors, we got to, there's an extra space to write something. And so being a Christian at the time, I wanted to put something meaningful. So I put that, but I, as I think back now, it's like, wow, Kelly, you really had no idea what this meant. You probably weren't really acting in love type of thing. But again, the patience, the kindness, the mercy of the Lord to not strike me down with a lightning bolt, but just gently, he's loved me along the way as I take my time to get my lessons and to to learn his ways and be sanctified. He's been so loving to me. So Mm -hmm. how can I not give that love back? Yeah, it's powerful. Well, we hope you enjoy this chapter. Definitely read 12 and 14. That's your Bible challenge this week, just to get the, the context. We pray that you have a good week and that you experience blessings and that you go in love. Yes. Bye.